This webinar will be made available uh, for viewing after the fact. You will receive an email link that will allow you to experience it in its entirety. So should you not be able to stay for the whole thing, you won't actually miss anything. You can go to the link and see what you what what else went on. Also, if you should like to share this information with your friends or family, that link will make it possible for you to do so. I am Brett Newcomb. I'm a licensed family counselor in the state of Missouri. I've been in private practice for over 30 years, working with families and couples about relationships. And this is Dr. Kathy Moffin, who is the founder and medical director of BioBalance Health. And together, we have written and had published our book, The Secret Female Hormone. So we'll make reference to that. And a lot of the information that we'll be talking about in this webinar is also referenced in the book. Uh, so what, uh, what we are most excited about is the opportunity to communicate with you directly should you have questions. We'll, we'll start talking about some of the information we want to share. We do have some questions that people have previously submitted. We'll take those. I uh, want to reassure you that your privacy is absolutely a major concern of ours, so we will not be identifying you in any way. Uh, we don't have identifiers for who you are. But if you would send us a, uh, a question or a comment that you'd like us to respond to, we'll be happy to try to field those as, uh, as we go on. Okay, so. good. So we're, we're going to get started by um, explaining that we ha I have a lot of questions every day in the office about sex. And so and questions that no one would ever ask in public or their friends or their family. Mm -hmm. These are the questions that we would like to address today. The questions that patients ask and are maybe too embarrassed mm -hmm. to entertain uh, asking anybody else but the, doc the doctor in the, in the confines of our office. So many of the questions are about sexual performance, both for men and right. women. Many are about orgasmic function, because many women come to me for hormones and may never have had enough testosterone to have an orgasmic mm -hmm. um, function at all. Mm -hmm. And most of my patients, after they get their testosterone, because it is the key hormone in both men and women for sex, and to make us want sex, have sex, functional for sex. So testosterone is kind of the right. key yes. to this. And this is, and I'm a, a specialist in hormone replacement and age management medicine. So most of the time I'm addressing people who have had a functional or happy sex life, mm -hmm. who have lost it with age or with illness, and who are trying to get it back. And at that time that opens the door to all these other questions that they've always wanted to ask somebody. Right. So we have some questions that we do. that have been sent to us, and we'd like to address those first. Okay. And we'll add um, we'll add some of our um, subjects that we've actually talked to our patients about as we go. All right. The first question is: I have experienced a complete loss of desire for any sexual intimacy, and I need help in getting to the bottom of the problem. So, yes. how would you respond to that if they? If they male or female comes in and says that. That's a very common uh, problem in my office. I mean, that's that's what, sometimes that's the only reason someone's coming to me is because a couple will come and bring one or the other partner and one of them has a sex drive and the other one has lost their sex drive. And so that's a big couple intimacy and, and uh, a couple problem. So, informationally, uh, I have to start by saying once again, testosterone is the foundation for being able to have a good sex life. And what this patient, I'm assuming here that she's over 40, but we'll address under 40. Right. So people over 40 um, require testosterone replacement in general to get their sex life back. That's the first hormone to go in the process of aging. And testosterone does so many more things than just sex, but it changes our brain. It changes our bodies. We're able to um, have vaginal intercourse and not have have our uh, vaginas be dry and painful. Mm -hmm. We're able to have a sex drive. We're able to feel like we are sexy because without testosterone, we don't we don't feel like sexual beings. It's, it's really an interesting conundrum because women will come in and say, I'm so tired, my life is so full, and I hadn't realized it until my husband challenged me about it. But I really don't ever think about sex anymore. I don't want it. I don't, don't want it in the sense that I don't desire it, not in the sense that I want to reject him, leave me alone. I still love him, yeah. but I don't love him. But, but it is, I, don't, <laughs> I don't feel that call. I don't feel that urge. And I didn't miss it when it went away. And he is complaining because one of the things about the way this works is that men lose their testosterone or start to lose it about 10 years later than women do. 
So you it's have totally this, unfair. Totally unfair. But you, we have this situation where the woman is losing the desire, and the man, and it depends a lot on the NMC of communication and safety of communication among the couple, how they approach addressing it. But the man starts testing. He starts blaming himself. Am I not doing something right? Am I not, you know, attractive anymore? Do I need to shower or whatever? Uh, <laughs> yes. And, and yes. The woman, <laughs> but but the woman often pretends not to know. You know, I'm just tired. Well, she doesn't. Uh, it's not on her list anymore. Without right. testosterone, your brain doesn't think about sex, and it doesn't. It just is not one of the options. So, in terms of desire, testosterone is the primary hormone in getting your desire back. So re so get it to a doctor who will do your blood work, find out where your testosterone level, and then replace it so that you get your desire back is important. Now, if you're under 40, right. and if you're on birth control pills or Depo-Provera or take any type of hormonal supplementation that has estrogen and progesterone in it, that can also suppress your sex drive. Even if you have your testosterone that's being made by your ovaries and it would be totally normal unless you suppress it with these birth control methods and it's not that I don't, there are other birth control methods you can use. But if this is you and you're under 40 and you have no sex drive and you're on the pill or you're on uh, Depo-Provera, then you should get another form of birth control Right. and then See if your testosterone if comes back. You or may not. Or antidepressants. That's going to impact. You. That's true. Antidepressants will take away your desire. Most of them. Uh, many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a question or a comment that you want to share with us and have us respond to, there is at the top left side of your screen a question mark icon. If you'll click on that, that'll give you an opening to type your question and we'll we'll get it that way. So you can participate at any time. Uh, you can join us and we'll, we'll continue our discussion. So we're talking about these these women. Uh, typically over 40, but sometimes you get younger women and younger men who come in with, with problems that are remedied by, I mean, part of your assessment is what kind of medicines are you on, what mm -hmm. kind of birth control are you on. Uh, part of your assessment is to take a blood test and find out what the level of free testosterone is, because it has to be at a certain volume of free testosterone for them to experience arousal at all. That's right, and, and, and that is a variable number. Some women need a lot of testosterone. Some women just need a little bit of testosterone to feel the exact same way. And that's a very complex physiologic process. It takes 12 steps within our bodies to get from testosterone to in the cell and working. So any of those things can go wrong, but the most frequent thing that goes wrong in people who have had a sex drive mm -hmm. that no longer have it is that they just lost or suppressed their testosterone somehow. And many people are depressed and they take and they take antidepressants and yeah. then their sex drive is worse. Even more compounded. Yeah. So. We have a question, what percentage of your patients get their sex drive back after receiving testosterone replacement? Percent. And some of them aren't there for sex drive. <laughs> yeah, they come in for other so, reasons. Yeah, and they may not have a partner and, and so that may not be a positive thing for them. Right, especially if they're older yeah. and single. Yeah, and see we're not old. No. Hopefully, yeah, right. we're not that but, old. But no, seriously, no, but I mean, we've we've had conversations mm -hmm. on our book tours with women who were in their 70s or 80s who were single, mm -hmm. and literally said to us, "I'm not sure I want that part back. Right? Can you just give me the part that helps my osteoporosis fatigue and the and the and the yeah. uh, get my energy back, get my joie de vivre back?" But right. um, no, <laughs> you have to take it all together. You'll get your sex drive back whether you want it or not. So, so the trick is to find the balance point. Right. The balance point where you feel rejuvenated enough that you think it's worth doing and you're, mm -hmm. you're satisfied, but not that you're rejuvenated to the point that that compounds your problems. And, and we do that every day. We start off with a certain dose and then, then we titrate the dose mm -hmm. as we go along. So it is very common for us to get people with sex drives back and, and orgasmic function. People who have never had orgasms that we give right. testosterone to, they may right. never have had enough testosterone and they get their orgasmic function they go oh that's it yeah. that's what oh, that that's was what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean people have been married uh, 30 years get their orgasm you know, it's hysterical because you think especially if you've had orgasms you think everybody has them and you think well it's just normal you know what it is and, and it reminds me when people come in and, and discover what it's like uh, oh um, they're ecstatic I mean they're like oh, it's so amazing <laughs> um, it reminds me when my oldest child was about three and threw up all over the bed he was ill 
and he was panicking. He was his eyes were bright, and he was sitting there, and he was looking at this. So it's like throwing up. He was afraid that he was in trouble, and all of a sudden, you could just see his mind click into gear, and he looked at me, and he said, "I know what that is. It's throw up." Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you've had women come yeah, in and say, "Oh my God, but it's no, not. <laughs> yeah. but it's a good thing. It's a good thing, absolutely." <laughs> But but it's that awareness of the experience. I, I have a response I'd like to make too about the the question, the way that it was framed, talked about sexual intimacy, mm -hmm. and there are differences in perception and function yes. for men and women about sexual intimacy. When men are younger, they, 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 the research methodologies talk about the triphasic reality of male sexual experience, and the triphases, three phases are desire, arousal, orgasm. Mm -hmm. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and they're done. And that's not about intimacy at all. And the same studies talk about women are capable of having arousal and orgasm without ever having desire. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll facilitate, I'll accommodate, we can do this, and oh my, that was good for me too. Mm -hmm. uh, but they never really thought or felt that they wanted it. It didn't they talk got talked, to they their kind of, hunger. They, got kind of talked they accommodated. Mm -hmm. And they so a lot of inner actions in, in couples is accommodative and should be mm -hmm. in either direction. That's not a failing. Uh, and then women can have desire and arousal, but not have orgasm. So, and, and then they can have all three. I mean, so so you you really get questions about intimacy. It's it's a different thing from the mechanical aspects of, of sexual function. I mean, intimacy it requires a wonderful relationship, and it requires communication, and it requires both sides to be involved. So that is something that I don't I don't take care of psychologists and family counselors do, but once we have the basic possibility of right. having sex right. by having enough testosterone that makes our oxytocin and our dopamine work, then then counsel away. Because well, <laughs> then it'll be more likely our, to work. Our next question that's mm -hmm. come in. Uh, once couples get their desire for sex back, what would you advise them to do in their relationship to heal the tension that has built up from a dis uh, discontent in the sexual relationship? That's a huge question. That is huge. And I see that all the time. Sometimes I will do follow-up mm -hmm. after one of the um, partners has their sex drive back, but that's your expertise. But my follow-up is usually I can see something that's obvious, like they've fallen into a pattern of criticism, Right. And then, especially when men have trouble with ED, sometimes wives won't even know they're doing it, and they're criticizing their husband and putting pressure on him. And so he can have he can have an erection, but he no longer is confident in it, and he's afraid. So he's right. afraid of being criticized. So he still can't do once, that, once even though his testosterone is good. split away from the sex act and the intimacy, and on the focus of do I have an erection? Is it firm enough? Is it enduring enough? Will it satisfy? He's toast. He's right. lost. Uh, he has so, to have the confidence, yes. and, ha and have the, so oftentimes I'll do the couple counseling in my office, kind of inadvertently because I'm not a counselor, but say, do you realize that this is happening, and do you realize that what it's doing, and and kind of just bring it out in the open. Then we have a little conversation, and most of the time, I mean, I remember one couple that we had that conversation. I said, do you feel like you have stage fright right. that you're being graded on this? And he said yes. And so I said, okay, so we're going to make an agreement not to right. not to do that. And they came back smiling, laughing, and telling my entire waiting room how good their sex life was, which was... <laughs> the, the waiting <laughs> rooms. They, everybody thought it was hilarious. Your waiting room is different. Yeah, I'm, I know. In, in a my mental waiting health room. waiting room, people are not making eye contact. They're not saying, oh, why are you here? What's wrong with you? In your waiting room, it's like, oh, we do this and we do that, and it's so good. It's really a <laughs> It's a whole different medical yeah. waiting room. Uh, but answer your question about counseling couples that have that disparate desire. Uh, Many couples have disparate desire. I mean, you don't have any guarantee that you have the same degree of sexual mm -hmm. hunger. The, and, and usually, over your relationship history, you've well, you've worked out a pattern for signaling and cueing and frequency that has worked for you. And then one of you lost the desire component, mm -hmm. and that pattern fell away. Uh, very frequently, in my experience, couples are not able to talk about that because the talks really tend tough. to be perceived as accusative or critical and not as informative and searching for uh, an answer. So one of the things that I work on with couples is trying to get them to work on their communication skills and the sense of safety. How can I articulate my fear, my concern, my need without fearing that you are going to use that as ammunition to hurt mm -hmm. me uh, or as a way to criticize or emasculate me and cut me down? 
uh, you, you need the same safety if you're going to raise a question. I talked to couples about uh, flirting behaviors. You know, start out early in the day and tease and flirt and build tension towards. Or just say, hey, let's have a date tonight. Which yeah. Is but how, how do you start to do that if you've never mm -hmm. done it? And if you are of a certain age and a certain cultural background, you will be afraid of talking about your needs or your fantasies because you'll be identified as a slut. Right. I mean, a woman of low moral standing, my or whatever, group, whatever it might be. And you know, people who are 59 yeah. and above, that was kind of a taboo. That was something you didn't talk about. So, so the so. short answer is better communication skills. The ability to safely and honestly talk about what do we want out of this? How are we going to approach it? How do we signal it? How do we understand? And sometimes you have to ask, what exactly are you saying? What are you asking for? What do you want? Because intimacy and, and, and foreplay is such a generic that term. That takes time. It too. can be hand-holding. You know, when we go for a walk around the block, hold my hand, smile at me, make well, eye if, contact. Well, if somebody like, if your partner touches yeah. you in a certain place and that makes you feel good, you have to right. say, that really made me feel good. You Feed, me there. Feedback is, is me very, very important and that's something that we rarely are trained to do or we don't do in modern life. We don't go, oh, that was a really nice thing to say to me. I mean, we don't say that. It's not, we're not, in, in the U.S., we're not really very polite. We don't give our feedback nicely like We've they, we, they do in Britain. I right. mean, they, oh, yes, yeah. Right. right man, that's that, you know, yeah. or old boy or whatever it is. Well, so. it's, funny, it's funny to have those conversations in my office because even there, the artificiality of my participation. Yeah, the third wheel. A, a different <laughs> dynamic, yeah, a witness, a third wheel, whatever, and they want to play off of me instead of talking to each other. Well, you know, the, the Masters and Johnson series that's on, right. I, I, I went to Masters and Johnson conferences, you know, the week-long conferences, it's all right. about sex back in... Mm, 80s, so early 80s. That's when they were doing that. And I had their books. And one of their my favorite things to bring up to couples is sexual appetite is just like eating. Okay, so right. when you you may not like. Okay, so it's just as different as I need to eat every four or five hours a little bit. Mm -hmm. My husband can go all day with right. not eating, but right. then he has to have a huge meal. Right. So it's just and like if you don't that. talk about that, and it's not okay to have differences, then there are problems. And if you have to always eat together, right. then that's going to be a problem. So you have to talk about your appetites, and, and if you feel uncomfortable about, about talking about sex, you can talk about just appetite. Well, <laughs> let's come back to that, on it, we have four or five more questions, yes. and if we need to, we can, if we have an opportunity, we'll come back and discuss this more. Uh, question is, what are uh, when a woman begins to take testosterone, are there side effects, hair on her lip, on her chest, what have you? Okay, so that's that's all mine. Yes, um, it is. I've been taking testosterone for almost, well, 12 years now. And the biggest side effect, and really the, the only side effect that I find to be really worrisome to women is facial hair. But most of us had facial, some facial hair when we were young. Then we got used to not having any facial hair. And then all of a sudden, we take testosterone and we get the facial hair back. So it's a matter of we accommodated to not having any. Oh, that was nice. I didn't have to be waxed or bleached or whatever. Right. So oftentimes, it's just getting back to where you used to be, both in your sexuality, your health, your body, and your facial hair. Sometimes it stimulates facial hair in people who have never had it and that's usually the most worrisome because they don't know what to do with it and that bothers them. We have several methods of not getting that side effect because if that's the biggest side effect, which it is, right. then why don't we just wipe it out? And there's a very safe medication called spironolactone mm -hmm. and it's it was originally a diuretic. It's off label for facial hair, but I've used it on teenagers, you know, girls right. that had a lot of um, receptor sites for testosterone and had hair everywhere and they were embarrassed by it. So I've used spironolactone a lot, a lot with women with polycystic ovaries. I use it with my patients who have the problem with facial hair and then they may have to get waxed once or twice a year. But it then, well, but they, that's not a big deal. Also, intellectually and honestly, they can make a choice. You will have this side effect. This is what it's going to be mm -hmm. like. But the trade-off is you'll have an active and happy sex life. And you'll be. Would you be willing to? But there's that so much more about testosterone, not right. just sex. Exactly. I mean, it's it's body it's body shape, it's muscle mass, it's longevity, it's the quick 
quickness of thought. It's so there's so much more on that scale that when you look at that scale and and all of those good things, facial hair doesn't look like much. Well, and but for some women, that's the that's. But it's not body uh, hair. I mean, right. we don't we don't haven't had complaints of body hair. So yes. uh, in women, okay. so and maybe le leg hair does go along with that, and pubic hair, but not but not hair where it shouldn't be. All right. Question: What are the costs now and ongoing down the road, and does an insurance uh, does insurance cover this at all? Well, that's um, an interesting question because it's different for men and women. Okay. So for men, we most centers that do this don't take insurance, but then we'll give you the invoice. And then you will send the invoice and all of the, the forms to your insurance company. Take that, send it, and then they will send you back whatever portion of it they right. will pay for. So in men, usually there is a 50% to 60% reimbursement. Now, to the patient. Now in women, rarely do my women get uh, reimbursed at all. And that's because the insurance company's reason is that they don't reimburse bioidentical hormones because I use testosterone, pure testosterone pellets. I don't use any kind of synthetic testosterone. So they're saying, well, we don't reimburse pure testosterone. Well, they do for the men. Right. So it's not a logical reason. Right. Or fair. Or fair. But um, I think we have a ways to go in women asking their insurance companies for this and or demanding it. I mean, we should have equal, equal treatment by right. insurance companies. And so that, that's an issue. But the cost for women is about $550 three times a year. So and, $1,500 a year. And for men, about $2,200 a year. Right. So again, you have to ask yourself, if it met, is it cheaper than a divorce? Is it cheaper than an affair? Is it cheaper than cosmetic surgery? You know, when you start chasing the tail of what could be causing this, is right. it cheaper than antidepressants? Is it cheaper than buying every single thing off the Internet every time they come up? Right. You know, and say, yeah. oh, that'll be it. That'll be it. I'll, I'll get that. I mean, you know, you can have boxes of that stuff that doesn't work. You right. take it a couple of times, you know it doesn't work, and you just wasted you 50 or 60 bucks. So the next question that, that's come in is when we knew we were going to get it. Uh, what is the average or normal frequency for older couples to have sex? And interestingly we, enough, yeah, there, there's been some numbers. research done. Uh, and th these are the statistics for different age groups that are current. But what's fascinating to me about this, if you go back and look at the past research, the average number of times per week has dropped. Yeah. Uh, and we don't know why. We don't know what the source of that is. Right now, for all couples of, of any age, the average uh, in the United States is 103 times a year. Uh, but five years ago, it was 118. And seven years ago, it was 127. So something that's a pretty is big making drop, it because that's yeah. yeah, that's average. I figure it's more fun to be on the computer. I mean, when you had a dull night, hey, what do you want to do, honey? Basically, there is no dull night anymore. Well, but it could be. It also could be testosterone. So, so here's the here are the age bracket averages for the most recent surveys that, that I've seen. Uh, Co-inhabitors, uh, cohabitors under the age of 35 reported having sex an average of 11 to 13 times a month. Married couples had sex 11. Point seven times a month. It's always interesting how averages work out. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the point seven, the kids yeah. come in, yeah. so I'm hungry. Uh, ages 19 to 24, 8.5 times a month. Ages 30 to 34, 5.5 times a month. 50 to 54, 2.4 times big job. a month. 65 to 69, 0.8 times a month. That was, yeah, well. and, and older didn't register. And they didn't have any numbers an for average. older on testosterone. Older than 75. I can tell you that those numbers aren't right for my patients. Right. I mean, I had I had a gal... Uh, Especially for the older brackets, for, for yeah. the 30, 40, 50, 60. I had a gal who's 50-something just mm -hmm. pop her head into my office and go, she goes like this. I go, what is that? <laughs> Seven right. times in one night. That's what she told me. I, I thought maybe that was per month. Was the same guy? It was her husband. That so he was on medicine as well. Yeah. Because yeah. Okay. Because yeah. those numbers. That's unusual, but I, I was refractory like refractory period shocked. is different for men. Than it is <laughs> yeah. Men, especially as they age. Although what they interesting enough, what they may okay, be talking about are intimate encounters as opposed to orgasmic encounters. Yeah, they may not have been. I mean, she was orgasmic seven times. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Right. I don't. I don't know what her. She what didn't give me the score? numbers oh, on his. He wasn't uh, yeah. there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, he was there. 
but she was all grins. And I mean, it was it was funny because I had to ask her what I, she was really telling me. Mm -hmm. And she just started giggling and laughing. Yes, and then she went out in the waiting room excited. and told everybody else about it. Exactly. <laughs> Another question we have is, do men usually need to continue using medication for ED after receiving testosterone replacement? That's a, a, an individual answer to that question. Mm -hmm. It's based on your health, your blood pressure, depression, other factors. But the research says that men who don't get testosterone replacement and have ED and take the ED medicines, 42% of those stop taking those medicines within three months. And, mm -hmm. and the reason behind it seems to be that you have to have arousal in order for the ED medicines to work. And so if you aren't aroused, even though you take the medicine, you're not going to get an erection. Yeah, ED medicine has nothing to do with sexual desire. Testosterone is what gives the arousal capacity back. And so what you find is that a lot of men who take the testosterone no longer need the ED medicine. The ED medicine then is necessary for them if they have a physiological issue mm -hmm. that prevents blood flow from uh, accumulating in the penis. And so then we get into other methodologies of getting or maintaining an erection from mm -hmm. taking shots uh, with a needle in the base well, of Well, I think ED usually is, is, if you're taking testosterone, mm -hmm. we don't, it would be rare. And you don't treat for that. It would be referring. rare to have to use right. something more than Viagra or Cialis. Mm -hmm. And we have a compounded uh, ED medication that works very well. So. We rarely have to get past that, but if we do, then we, we have uh, specialists that teach men how to give themselves shots before mm -hmm. intercourse. Yes. And that's usually in diabetics or people with bad um, vasculature, mm -hmm. so that they can't get the blood flow into the penis. And so desire is not going to, um, desire is there, and they are able to uh, start, maybe start to get an erection, but can't, can't hold it or it's not adequate to have intercourse, and they want to have intercourse, so they will go to great lengths. In people who have had surgery or who have uh, diabetic problems, severe diabetes, where all the micro vessels everywhere in your body are damaged, right. then they have to use implants, surgical implants, a urologist type procedure. Right, there are or, two different kinds of surgical implants they can mm -hmm. get. One is a, a, a fluid reservoir and pump, with a little button that's under the skin of the scrotum. Mm -hmm. You push it to pump it up and you mm -hmm. push it to release it. One is two uh, rods that you slide apart and twist to lock into place to get your erection. In, in, inside. In, that are inside. Yeah, uh, they're the skin implanted. The right. yeah. so, so there are ways to help with that. Uh, but, the, but those the, are pretty extreme and I don't see and people they're like rare. that too they're much. Very rare. Uh, a couple more questions are coming in mm -hmm. that I think we need to try to skip to. Uh, do men use uh, that one? Are women supposed to have orgasm every time they have sex? No, and neither no. are men. <laughs> sex isn't about orgasm per se. Orgasm is a component of the sexual experience. Sex becomes more about intimacy. And what you learn, what men in particular, because when they are younger, for most men it is about orgasm. And they keep count and they keep track and they, you know, Share Some data never forget to do and brag. Their yeah. whole lives. <laughs> uh, but as they get older, they learn that it's more about intimacy. It's more about communication and touching and soothing and pleasing. And they usually have some release. It's not, but it's not the same kind of release that they've had in the past. The same intensity, they, the same right. level, and and often no fluid. That you can have a, a full blown orgasm, so to speak, without any ejacula of any kind. Yeah, the ejaculate is goes down in amount as men get older. Right. So th that's contributed to by the prostate and um, this, the um, epididymis. So that de develops the fluid and those tend to be testosterone sensitive. So testosterone helps right. the amount of ejaculate and some men are very, very concerned about that. It doesn't mean that nothing's working. It doesn't right. mean that you aren't well, and their wives having an concerned. orgasm. If you're not having uh, ejaculate release, she may be feeling like you're not satisfied and she's done something inadequate or wrong. Right. Which comes back to the whole thing about communication that we were talking about. So then you just have to you ask. You need to be talking about it. Exactly. But it's not just, but the ejaculate, we help if you need to, or if you feel like that's not adequate but everything else is working. We usually use L arginine and ornithine as a combination. Yeah. And that helps. A you know, somewhat in terms of the volume of ejaculate, but it does not, it doesn't bring it back to what, like when you were 30. Okay, so there are two questions. One's a little bit longer and, and technical in terms mm -hmm. of the specific 
uh, situation of this individual. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is a generic one. Let's take the generic one first because it, it flows from this conversation. Mm -hmm. I've heard that there are different types of orgasm for women. What is the difference between or among them? Yes, and that's that's one of those things that most people don't talk about. Right. So, there, you can have orgasms, four different kinds of orgasms, and they are from the, uh, actually there's some controversy over that, but I'll give you the most likely, right. or the right. most accepted. One is clitoral, clitoral is the most common, and the, the clitoris is, is right above the urethra where, the, where people urinate from. So, so the clitoris is the most common type, partially because it's external, and if women learn to, to be stimulated on their own, they're stimulating themselves, it's easier to get to. So Well, and there are nerve bundles that go from each of these right. sites that you're going to be talking about right. straight to the spinal cord. Right. So the stimulation... Different levels of the spinal cord, too. Yes. So they all have a different pathway. It's like having four different highways to get to your brain. Or channels, you will. Right. Yeah. And so that... So if one doesn't work, then the other does. And if you have a spinal cord injury, if there's one above that, then you can be stimulated to orgasm from that area. But... There's, there's the clitoris, there's the G-spot, which is in the vagina, about an inch in and on the top of the vagina, if you're lying down, uh, or the anterior side, the front side. And then we have the cervical uh, orgasm, and then there's a controversy between around, around the anus or around mm -hmm. the, the vaginal, the tissue around the vagina. So, like the labia. But all of those have their own pathways, so maybe there's five and not four. But uh, every area can be stimulated, and they feel different. They're described as feeling different. Um, they describe the G-spot orgasm as something that feels like it's pushing down, kind of like a to the woman. It's a, it, it feels like everything's pushing out. And then the cervical orgasm is like everything's pulling in. And um, the, the other two are variable. They're more um, nebulous. Yeah. And then the clitoral orgasm is, is kind of like the fireworks area. I think it lights up everything. It's so, also possible for women to have uh, fluid ejacula just the same as men do. Yeah, and, they, and no one talks about that, and they are very embarrassed by it because they think they just urinated. Right. And that's, that's a scary thing for a woman to think that she's released urine during intercourse. And, and it's not. It, it looks... It's from clear to white and maybe even slightly yellow. It doesn't smell like urine, doesn't have any, and it's slippery, and urine's not. So it's, and it can be a very small amount or it can be a large amount. And this is something that's very sticky in terms of people. I don't mean sticky literally. I mean, people don't want to talk about this. Right. When I bring it up, right. then, then, that, then they'll talk about it, right. and then they always start smiling, like, how did you know? Yes. So... Um. This is a technical question that involves medical uh, dosages from, oh, from okay. a client. So I have been prescribed 50 milligrams of DHEA and point, uh, 0 0.5 milligrams of estradiol. I'm 58 years old and have postmenopausal uh, and am postmenopausal. I've been on these medicines for almost three months. I'm experiencing lubrication in the vagina for the first time in many years, but not much uh, else has changed. As per Dr. Dr. Maupin's recommendation from her last webinar uh, on who in my area, she's in Connecticut, uh, follows mm -hmm. her beliefs or practices the way she does. I'm seeing a particular doctor. Unfortunately, he doesn't know about you or your book, so I'm not sure I'm on the right path. Do you have any advice on how I should proceed? Get him a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would. I mean, all the references are there if he wants to the, look up the, the research references, references that he would need. Uh, also, uh, put him on our website. The information is there as well if he's willing to take the time to to read about it. But certainly, you should be informed if you've read the book. Bring up the specific information, the questions you have. My guess is it's a question of the dosage for the testosterone. It's not testosterone, it's DHEA. Okay, so let's go backwards a little bit. DHEA is a supplement you can get over the counter. DHEA is actually the precursor to testosterone, and it's made in the adrenal gland. So when we give DHEA, we think, oh, we're giving testosterone, but we're, we're, tr we're doing it in a tricky way. We don't have to have a prescription or anything mm -hmm. else. Well, it works very well for men because men's testicles never really go into what we call senescence or they never go into hibernation. Women's ovaries go into hibernation and basically die. They don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So view the ovary like a factory 
you give DHEA, you give the, the substrate or something that is supposed to be the, the prime. Um, you drop off the raw the, materials. The material. The machinery's not running. Yeah, right. And, and the machinery is not running, so it doesn't make any testosterone. So if you had your testosterone tested, it wouldn't work. So prior to menopause, giving DHEA to women sometimes does help testosterone. If you're giving DHEA to women who are already on testosterone, that in general doesn't work because it, it has enough testosterone, your body has enough, so it diverts it and makes more of the things you don't want like estrone or dihydrotestosterone that causes people to be hairy. The only exception to the rule is 7-keto DHEA and you can take that for skin thickness and to, to make your skin a little oilier or thicker, okay. but it isn't going to make testosterone. So he's just giving you estradiol. Not, and what you're feeling is an estradiol um, uh, outcome, is that you have more lubrication. But none of the other things are going to happen unless you get testosterone. Okay, so men, uh, are there side effects for men when they take testosterone? And is there a higher risk for heart attack or weight gain? Okay, there are side effects to taking testosterone for men, and that's usually oily skin, acne. It can cause some hair loss at the top of uh, top of their heads and at the. And I, I could show you about that. You still have a lot of hair. <laughs> any, in any case, men, men, that's basically it is cosmetic kind of things that are are the side effects. The uh, there is no increased rate of a heart attack with non-oral testosterone and pure testosterone. Well, so actually, if we're talking gels and creams, that's different than non-oral under the skin like a shot or a pellet. Right. Those don't cause heart attacks. Those don't cause strokes. What we use doesn't have those kind of side effects. And it the only stuff has that good, you see in the news effects. media about testosterone and heart attacks where the lawyers are now advertising, if you've ever driven past the testosterone clinic, you know, get in touch with us because we're going to sue. Uh, because you'll have a heart attack. The research that they that underlies that approach was done in a veterans hospital among veterans 65 and older who had previous histories of heart attacks and strokes. Mm -hmm. And they were given testosterone and some of them had subsequent heart attacks. And so everybody's running scared saying the sky's falling, the sky's falling. It if was a small number do, of patients. It was a bad study. And yes. It, many so, parts of the study have been retracted, but not to the public. Right. So, but having said that, creams and gels make a lot of estrogen. Estrogen can cause some of these problems with clotting and thickening the blood for, um, for men. So, creams and gels aren't as safe a testosterone avenue as shots and, and pellets. pellets. Right. Uh, the other thing is, the only other thing that I, can, uh, that I have as, as a risk factor for some men, genetically who have a high red cell count mm -hmm. or have hemochromatosis, so that's a specific group of people, testosterone will increase their red blood count. So they have to keep giving blood and get rid of Draining the blood. Draining some of that excess. Get rid of the blood so right. that they don't have so much blood that the, it sludges in their vessels. So that's a specific type of patient or person with a specific genetics that might have uh, a side effect from testosterone, but we check all that ahead of time and during the, the treatment, right. and that's what's really required. We want to see how much a, an individual patient has as a risk factor to begin with, and we do all these studies initially. Then we watch after we've treated them, did they make a lot of DHT? Did they make a lot of estrogen? Well, then we have to block it, or we have to change dose, or we have to change type of uh, pellets that we use. A corollary question to the heart attack question mm -hmm. is the question, are you likely to have a heart attack during sex at a certain mm -hmm. age or if you have a heart history? And the research says that, that the odd, they, they studied like 55,000 men, 20 of them had heart attacks mm -hmm. while having sex. Right. So, so the odds, uh, uh, elderly men. But and, and what they said was the critical factors for those men were not heart condition, it was, have you just eaten a large meal? Have you been drinking a lot of booze? And are with you? Some, are you with someone other than your partner? Than your wife. Yes. So if <laughs> so those are the those three are the yeses, factors. you're more likely to have a heart attack while you're having sex. Right. So, so if you've been cleared after a heart attack to right. have sex, right. then the advice is to slowly get into this. Don't you know? Don't plan on having an all night event. Yes. Just slowly get into your routine. Don't do a marathon. 
Yeah, don't do a marathon, do just, do, just jog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if the hormone does not restore dry, the sex drive and the other advantages, is there any other way to prime the pump or do we have to learn to live without the hormone advantages? That's, so, so, so the question is, is if the hormones female? don't work to restore the sex drive, the libido, is there anything else that they no. can do? Okay. The hormones meaning testosterone, because most people when they go to their doctor and their doctor says, here's a hormone, they're talking about estrogen. And estrogen doesn't help the sex drive. It will help you be more lubricated, but it doesn't help sex drive and it doesn't help sexual thoughts or, or activities for women. So if you're talking about estrogen that you got in a pill or a cream or a gel or right. a patch, then that's not going to help sex drive. So t using testosterone would be an answer to that. She, and if that's not what you're, you're asking, if what you're asking is after we tried everything and we don't get a sex drive back, I guess the question is, did you ever have a sex drive? Well, because some people exactly. don't have a sex drive for psychological or post-abuse reasons. That's what I was going to say. It's, testosterone doesn't give you a sex drive back after a trauma like that. Right. That has to be worked out. Well, it, with it actually does. Mechanically, it, it does. does. But your psychology blocks that. You, you numb out. You dissociate from sexual arousal, sexual drive. That's a very common experience of, of frustration uh, among abused women uh, who either remember or were told that they had orgasms and seemed to be aroused and satisfied during the abuse. Yeah, they right. went away somewhere and their body betrayed them. Mm -hmm. You know, and the abuser will say, "Well, obviously you liked it." That's, that's, uh, that's not what's going on horrific. there. <laughs> the, the mind is an incredibly powerful tool for protecting you. And if that's a component of your reality, then just getting testosterone back is not going to solve the problem. You still need the, the talk therapy. You still need the relationship communication. You need to work on uh, understanding that you can have sexual intimacy without orgasm and still have wonderful sexual experiences. Not everybody is going to be orgasmic every time. Uh, as we related in the previous question uh, about men and women, so I, I, I have patients that have had 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 abused as children or abused right. as teenagers, and who are who are anorgasmic, but mm -hmm. they still have with because the testosterone gave them back the ability to respond, and right. they're in love with their partners. Right. That has they, given they them the ability to have good sex, to have good sex have but not orgasmic. Uh, also, there may be other factors, depression, anxiety, antidepressants that can be complicating it. The, the, the testosterone by itself uh, isn't all you have to consider. You have to consider the rest of your physical and, and uh, physiological circumstances. So we, so we would need more information yeah. for your specific circumstance. Uh, my wife is a very satisfied patient of Dr. Moffitt's and is encouraging me to start testosterone replacement therapy with Dr. Moffitt. What are the side effects of this condition? I'm 56 year old, old male with type 2 diabetes. Well, a 56 year old male with type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. will have um, actually the benefits of having less requirement for drugs for their type 2 diabetes if they take testosterone. They will build more muscle mass, so they will burn their calories better and they'll lose weight. So that's another benefit to their type 2 diabetes. Uh, the, the question is, will he still have trouble having an erection? Because type 2 diabetes can damage vasculature to the penis. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is the case, the only thing you can do is try it. Right. It's not going to cause side effect or make you sicker with type 2 diabetes. It's going to make you healthier. And that's a, that is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. You know, I mean, you're going to be healthier. You're going to get your sex drive back. You should get some ability to respond to ED medicines mm -hmm. in general. And it may not be what you had when you were very young and didn't have diabetes, but it'll be better than what you have now. So I think it's a benefit to your illness. It is not a risk factor for your illness. Right. And it's a benefit. Um, I mean, it's a benefit to your marriage if if you are able to at least have a sex drive and and start the process mm -hmm. of intimacy, and then 
we can try some of these other you know medications or I can refer you to someone who will uh, take care take care of the uh, erection part right um, it's also important to remember that you can have an orgasm without an erection mm -hmm. you can have sexual relief and participate in intimacy without vaginal penetration there, there are things that you can do but you're we assume that your question presumes classic traditional penetrative uh, mm -hmm. intercourse to orgasm. Mm -hmm. And that can happen, but there may be complications that you need to refer to a different doctor but, for. But you're not gonna you're not gonna know until you try. Until you until you try, and it's not gonna hurt your diabetic state or your health, it's going to help it. Well, and part of your question goes back to the previous question and reminds me that we didn't answer that part. Is there an issue with weight gain for men taking testosterone? Oh, okay. So Weight gain with pellets is not an issue. Men usually lose weight on pellets, mm -hmm. and and that means subcutaneous implants, or sometimes on shots they'll lose weight mm -hmm. because it's not pure testosterone. It's depotestosterone, which is different. But on the gels, there's an interesting phenomena. Men start feeling better. They start making some muscle, but then all, the second month on the gels, they make a lot of fat, so that counters it. Then they have to go up in dose. Then they feel better and then the following month they feel worse and then they go up in dose and so they keep they have like three or four times the dose and then they're gaining belly fat because estrogen makes men gain belly fat mm -hmm. so if you're that guy then you're not gonna be able to take creams gels or patches right. you're going to have to use something that's pure testosterone under the skin in some way so that you don't gain weight you're not supposed to gain fat, you're supposed to become leaner. Testosterone stimulates growth hormone. Mm -hmm. It's a twofer. Your growth hormone should come up when you get your testosterone back. And we see it more quickly in men. Men seem to get their muscles back faster. They get leaner. We can see the definition in their muscles right. faster. And, and they lose weight faster. So weight meaning fat, not lean body mass. Your lean body mass goes up. And you know, weight has a lot to do with muscle. A pound of muscle is about that big, like a pound of steak. And a pound of fat is fat like that. Right. So if you lose a pound of fat and gain a pound of muscle, you haven't lost weight. You still weigh the same. You yeah. weigh the same, but you're smaller. And your muscle is burning calories all the time. So eventually it'll be easier for you to lose weight. So initially you change dimension and size, but not weight. Right. Belt size. Belt size. Okay. Um, what else does testosterone therapy help with besides stronger libido? Oh, so much. <laughs> it helps with your energy which, and, and motivation to get out and go do things. So it's really hard to exercise if you're not motivated. Crisper, so, sharper thinking? Yes. Sleeping? And no depression. You, you have a better mood. You don't, most of my patients are able to come off antidepressants if they haven't been on them their whole lives. Mm -hmm. Decreases anxiety. Testosterone for men, I see that all the time that people, the guys come in, they go, I'm having anxiety attacks and I'm mm -hmm. crying at, at movies, you know, and I right. never did that before. So testosterone will suppress the effects of the estrogen that they're making. And that that's so much better. If they have, if they have high cholesterol, it drops cholesterol the way we give it. Yeah. If they have high blood pressure, because they're losing fat, gaining muscle, they become less insulin resistant and their blood pressure usually comes down. So we usually see a decrease in dose of, of uh, blood pressure medicine, and some people can go off their cholesterol medicines. We see a decrease in um, heart issues. I had one patient who had had a heart attack early on when he first started. Mm -hmm. He was just he he was the perfect case of a for a heart attack, and he was about 50 pounds overweight. And we had just started treating him, and he did have a heart attack right. while taking the pellets. It didn't cause it. But I mean, yeah, right after proximity. Pellet, but, proximity yeah. doesn't. Well, it was about six months. But um, but he lost a great proportion of his of his muscle of his heart. And since testosterone is anabolic, he asked his cardiologist if he could continue doing the pellets. His cardiologist went through all the literature and said yes. So the good news is he was predicted to only have 25 percent of his ejection fraction, which means the the ability of your heart to to actually squeeze blood out of it. Mm -hmm. So he's only predicted to have that, and he's up above 50. He's almost 60%. Right. So 
he's way beyond what they even gave him as, as, as an estimate of getting his heart function back. And he's normal. He's now lost like 60 pounds. His skin's he not exercises blue. He's not pasty. He's, he's not. exercises all the time. His brain works great. He's, I mean, he's healthy and he feels wonderful. Yeah. So these are, these are examples of what testosterone can do for you. It also keeps you from going to the nursing home. It keeps your muscles strong. It keeps you, you know, the reason we go to the nursing home is we either can't see, we can't think, or we can't walk. Well, so, you fall and you break something. You're on a walker. You yeah. can't stand up. You lose your balance. You're fragile. You're bone. So that's all about balance. And yeah. balance has to do with testosterone and having muscle mass to hold you up. Right. So if you don't have muscle mass, then, you, you know, you easily fall over. But testosterone also helps your balance itself. Well, I can tell you personally, I was on... Uh, anti-cholesterol and anti-blood pressure medicines for 25 years and I started on testosterone about three three and a half years ago pellets uh, I've lost 30 pounds I've come off of every medicine I was ever on I'm not taking anything anymore no cholesterol no blood pressure um, and you were early diabetes yeah and that's gone too uh, my triglyceride numbers are right where they need to be so um, it does I mean miraculously it it really does back up the physiology of aging. And, so and none of that specifically references libido. No, none that's what the question. Not, was. Yeah, none of that is. I mean, libido. Sure, we're talking about one of the reasons people will come to me, but then they get all of these other, right. all these other benefits. It also prevents Alzheimer's, dementia, some of the other things that make us dependent on others. It prevents or significantly delays. Delays. If you're genetically predisposed to to have dementia or Alzheimer's. You, if you live long enough, you'll still get it. Right? If you live long enough, you'll still get it, but it's a 10-year delay for testosterone. And in women, if they take estrogen during the first 10 years after menopause, and they take testosterone in the first 10 years after they lose their testosterone, which is 40-something, then they get 20 years of a delay. So it's more likely you'll die of something else rather than get Alzheimer's right. before you die. So, so we have about five minutes left. If you have a question you want to get it in, remember to go up to the left-hand corner of your screen and click on the question mark and you can send us a question. I uh, received another question that, that asked about the money factor. Mm -hmm. uh, is it true that the testosterone pellet is placed under the skin? How long does the pellet last? How often does it have to be replaced? Does it have to be replaced on an ongoing basis forever? Mm -hmm. uh, and are there costs other than the 550 three times a year? Okay, so let's see. The, pellet, the pellets in women have to re, be replaced in general every four months. Some women are three months. Some women are six. I even have a few that are a, a year. So it depends every on your year. activity level, your metabolism. And how, yeah, and how old you are. Yeah. So I have, I have, I mean, a year is an amazing um, Stretch. Dura duration yeah, for, for, $500. for $500. So that would be, but, but the fee is based on the instruction the actual procedure itself, the, con the consultation during that procedure, and the number of pellets that you have. So for that, the average is 550. That's okay. basically what what I was giving you. So another cost is when you first come in and on your second visit four months later, there are two consultations with me. One is to get to figure out your dose. Another is to tweak the dose. And if you have any other medical problems, work on those. So that is, is something that uh, I take care of at the time. So I'm doing things that other doctors would be doing. So you may, and you can send in, even for women, the consultation visits can be reimbursed by insurance and, and usually are. But the out of pocket is the pellets. Men, it's twice a year and in general, and it's usually about $1,100 each time because men get a lot of pellets, and that's a per pellet. Yeah, it's a volume. Kind of, it's a volume. It's like how many pellets does this man need? So that's what the cost is based on is the insertion part, the visit for that, and how many pellets do you need? And, and the pellets are placed under the skin, and as a result of that, they, they create an on-demand or as-needed reservoir in your body, just like the the original manufacturers wanted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, testicles and ovaries you did that for us, but this is this isn't as good, but it still is better than everything else. Creams we have. and gels because it's so hard to regulate dosage and delivery uh, as needed. Uh, mm -hmm. The pellets obviate all of that. You don't have to do. Yeah, you asked also if it was um, they 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 dissolve completely. Usually, pellets last longer than our repeat time because we repeat it before you get down to zero. So right. usually they're still in there two months later. 
but they're almost gone. And they go down to nothing and they dissolve completely. So well, nothing you, has to be taken out and it does have to be continued as long as you want to feel like this. And, and if you pay attention, you can you can tell when it's time for your testosterone. Yeah, your wife tells you. My wife tells me because the, the testosterone and estrogen balance changes and I get all moody and sensitive and teary, <laughs> offended and hurt easily. I'm, next time I'm going to have Phyllis call me Just call get like that. I want to hear you like that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, that was so rude. I deny it, but uh, she, she attests to it, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, another question. I'm a 57-year-old male. From a recent test, my testosterone level is in the 200s. My doctor told me that this is in the normal range, as normal in quotes, for a man my age would be anywhere from 200 to 600. What is your opinion? What is the normal testosterone level for a 57-year-old man? Okay, so now we have to look at normal, definition of normal. Normal as a lab shows it is they take they take all the guys that age and they put them on a bell curve and they view normal as anything in that bell curve except for the way out here the two, last two standard deviations, two standard from, deviations the norm. from the norm yep. is that big bell and if you're out here you're abnormal. Well that's not how I define normal and that, that's not how anti-aging doctors and age management doctors do or anybody who's replacing hormones for a living. We're looking at normal just like we would for other things like like cortisol or we're trying to get the normal back to where you were when you were young. We're not looking at other people 57 because testosterone drops with age, growth hormone drops with age, estrogen drops with age. We're not comparing you to your own age. We're comparing you to young healthy men 20 to 40 and that is 400 to 1100. And that is, and some men at 60 and 70 need 1,100, or they don't feel well. And some men barely need 400. And, and you're looking at the it's difference between free different. testosterone and right. total testosterone. Right. Total. We're talking to, total testosterone. If we're looking at free testosterone, which means the active part of the testosterone, the to, everything that's not free is invisible to your body. It's just circulating, but doing nothing. Well, it's already used. It's bound up with mm -hmm. other components of your body, and so it's, it's not. It's storage. Yeah. But your body can't see can't it. Can't unstore it. Yeah, I can't see and, it. Well, it can't unstore it if you had a big blood loss. Yeah. That's what it's there for. But in general, if you have, you have to know the free testosterone number, and that magic number is 129 in men. It should be over 129 and up to 350 for m most men to feel normal and not have ED and not be, and not have all of these other symptoms we just discussed. But the, but the normal, quote, blood test doesn't measure free. No, and it doesn't even give you normal for a young healthy person, which right. is, or normal for functional. We've, we, they, we've done bunches, of, we've done a lot of studies in the uh, anti-aging community and they found that men are functional at 400 and above. Right. So why is 200 normal? If you're not functional at any number, well, it's you normal should look into we're all it. Drifting down. Well, there's, and, and that's what the whole message is, if you a, replace that, because you don't have to drift down. No, you don't have to. There's a perfect example of something that was is kind of a new test, mm -hmm. and that's a bones. When we do bone densities of women, uh -huh. we get what's called a T-score. A T-score compares you to young, healthy women or young, healthy men, 29 years old. So they look at your bones when you're 60, and they say, "Oh, you're you're two standard deviations below where you should have been at 29." We don't we don't do that with hormones, and we should. That's a perfect example of one test that is properly viewed, but when they put the lab, they have a lab test and they just say normal, right. I mean, because it's in the column for normal doesn't mean that you're well, Yeah. especially if it's hormones. Well, because, and that's, that's a contradiction of terms and a challenge of concept because are we looking at your age cohort? Do you fit with most of the people? Are you as sick as everybody group? else in, yeah, your, exactly. in your age group? Or are you healthy? If and we did that with bones, no one would have osteoporosis or osteopenia because everybody's bones dissolve with time just like everybody's hormones go down so I would say I'd, I'd find somebody who did age management medicine and and be evaluated right. because obviously I, your doctor probably wouldn't do it I, well, I mean I don't think if he thinks this is normal then it's a whole different education and again one of the things if you if you found your way to this webinar one of the things that we would encourage you to do, if you've not done so already, is get a copy of our book, The Secret Female Hormone. 
most of the things that we've covered in terms of the, the medical issues and the technology about testosterone mm -hmm. are covered and explained in this book. Arm yourself with some information and then go in and have a conversation with your physician. There are checklists in the book that will help you identify if you have the symptoms that represent testosterone imbalances or estrogen imbalances or all the different hormones that are involved. So you can take those checklists, then you can walk into the doctor's office and should he be like the, the physician that, that was referenced earlier today uh, and not be aware of this information, you can get him a copy of the book and ask him to read it. So we would encourage you to do that. I think that would help. And you can get that at Books a Million, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, online, uh, you can get it at Dr. Moffitt's office. Or Hay House. Or Hay, Hay House, House Publishing or SecretFemaleHormone.com. Right. We'll give you the information on how to acquire it. Um, oh, we, we also, Kathy and I do a podcast once a week on topics of medical interest and particularly of hormone replacement therapy. We will be doing in the next month a couple more podcasts on this topic. So if you have questions that you weren't able to get answered today, we would encourage you to still send them to us and we'll try to address them in those uh, podcasts. You can go to biobalancehealth.com, you can go to drkathymoppin.com and find the link to the podcast. They're available on iTunes uh, and YouTube. Uh, and and you, off our website. And our website. So we appreciate your participation. We hope that you found this to be useful. I want to remind you that you will be receiving an email link to this webinar so that you can watch it again later if you, if you want to. If you uh, would like to send it to someone and ask them to watch it who you have a concern about or it matters to you, you can send them that link. Uh, you can also, as we uh, end this presentation, the last thing that you will see is the website for biobalancehealth.com, which is where you can find out about the podcast, the skincare products, the hormone replacement therapies, uh, this webinar, and all of the other things that we do through Biobalance Health. As always, we thank you very much for your interest and your participation. Hope you learned something.